Hi, my name is Amanda Zeba. Welcome to my channel, Learning with a Word Nerd. Today, I flipped the calendar to April, which means that it is officially National Poetry Month. And to celebrate, I'm going to be sharing with you a novel and verse for each of the Fridays that follow. The first one I'm going to share with you is Out of the Dust by Karen Hess. Now, this is probably one of the most popular novels in verse, and that is because, or partly because, it was the winner of the Newbery Award in 1997. Uh, now, what is a novel in verse, you might be asking yourself. A novel in verse is a story that is told entirely in poetry. It can be any kind of poem, but most frequently it's uh, free verse poems. And a lot of times, uh, students who are reluctant readers, these are the books that I recommend to them, and they like them because there are so very few words in the book that when they're reading, uh, it goes really fast, which is a great feeling, a feeling of accomplishment. Um, but as a person who loves words, as a writer and as a teacher, I love novels and verse for an entirely different reason. And that is because the writer has to pick just the perfect word because they only get so few, so few less than when they're writing a book in prose, which is how most chapter books that you've probably read are written. Um, they have to pick just the right word, and it's the combination of those perfect choices that make the story something special. Um, this book is written in chapters, so I'm just going to read you the first 20 pages, but before I do that, I want to read the back so you kind of know a little bit about the story before I begin. A terrible accident has transformed Billy Joe's life, scarring her inside and out. Her mother is gone. Her father can't talk about it. And the one thing that might make her feel better playing the piano, is impossible with her wounded hands. To make matters worse, dust storms are devastating the family farm and all the farms nearby. While others flee from the dust storm, each one is left to find peace in the bleak landscape of Oklahoma and the surprise of the landscape of her own heart. Now, uh, you might have guessed by the title and a little bit by the back, this is also historical fiction, which means it takes place in the past around an event that is well known by many people. Um, even though the Dust Bowl is real and the things that happened during this time period are real and the things that the author is going to mention uh, definitely happened, Billy Joe is a made up character. That's the fiction part of it. So a novel in verse, historical fiction by Karen Hess, Out of the Dust, so many amazing things. Let's begin. Winter, 1934. Beginning, August, 1920. As summer wheat came ripe, so did I. Born at home on the kitchen floor, Ma crouched barefoot and bare-bottomed over the swept boards because that's where Daddy said it'd be best. I came too fast for the doctor, bawling as soon as Daddy wiped his hand around the inside of my mouth. To hear Ma tell it, I hollered myself red the day I was born. Red's the color I've stayed ever since. Daddy named me Billy Joe. He wanted a boy. Instead, he got a long-legged girl with wide mouth and cheekbones like bicycle handles. He got a red-headed, freckle-faced, narrow-hipped girl with a fondness for apples and a hunger for playing fierce piano. From the earliest I can remember, I've been restless in this little panhandle shack we call home, always getting in Ma's way with my pointy elbows, my fidgety legs. By the summer I turned nine, Daddy had given up about having a boy. He tried making me do. I look just like him. I can handle myself almost everywhere he puts me, even on the tractor, though I don't like it much. Ma tried having other babies. It never seemed to go right, except with me. But this morning, Ma let on how she's expecting again. Other than the three of us, there's not much family to speak of. Daddy, the only boy Kelby left since Grandpa died from cancer that ate up most of his skin and Aunt Ellis, almost 14 years older than Daddy and living in Lubbock, away south from here and a whole world apart to hear Daddy tell it. And Muth Ma, only Great Uncle Floyd, old as ancient Indian bones and mean as a rattler, rotting away in that room down in Dallas. I'll be nearly 14, just like Aunt Ellis when Daddy was born by the time this baby comes. Wonder if Daddy'll get his boy this time. Rabbit Battles Mr. Noble and Mr. Romney have a bet going as to who can kill the most rabbits. It all started at the rabbit drive last Monday over to Sturgis when Mr. Noble got himself worked up about the damage done to his crop by Jacks. Mr. Romney swore he'd had more rabbit trouble than anyone in Cimarron County. They pledged revenge on the rabbit population, wagering who could kill more. 
They ought to just shut up, betting on how many rabbits they can kill. Honestly, grown men clubbing bunnies to death makes me sick to my stomach. I know rabbits eat what they shouldn't, especially this time of year when they could hop halfway to liberal and still not find food, but Miss Freeland says if we keep plowing under the stuff they ought to be eating, what are they supposed to do? Mr. Noble and Mr. Romney came home from Sturgis Money with twenty, twenty rabbits apiece. A tie. It should have stopped there, but Mr. Romney wasn't satisfied. He said Noble cheated. He brought in rabbits somebody else killed. And so the contest goes on. Those men. They used to be best friends. Now they can't be civil with each other. They scowl as they pass on the street. I'm scowling, too. But scowling won't bring the rabbits back. They're all skinned and cooked up and eaten by now anyway. At least they didn't end up in Romney and Noble's cookpots. They went to families that needed the meat. Losing Livy. Livy Killian moved away. I didn't want her to go. We'd been friends since first grade. The farewell party was Thursday night at the Old Rock Schoolhouse. Livy had something to tease each of us about, like Ray, sleeping through history class, and Hillary, who on her speed writing test put an even ton of children instead of an even ten. Livy said goodbye to each of us separately. She gave me a picture she'd made of me sitting in, my front of, in front of my piano, wearing a straw hat, an apple halfway to my mouth. I handed Livy the memory book we'd all filled with our different slants. I couldn't get the muscles in my throat relaxed enough to tell her how much I'd miss her. Livy helped clean up her own party, wiping spilled lemonade, gathering sandwich crusts, sweeping cookie crumbs from the floor, and while the rest of us went home to study for semester reviews. Now Livy's gone west, out of the dust, on her way to California where the wind takes the rest sometimes, and I'm wondering what kind of friend I am, wanting my feet on that road to another place instead of Livy's. Me and Mad Dog. Arlie Wanderdale, who teaches music once a week at our school, though Ma says he's no teacher at all, just a local song plugger. Arlie Wanderdale asked if I'd like to play a piano solo at the Palace Theater on Wednesday night. I grinned, pleased to be asked, and said, that'd be all right. I didn't know if Ma would let me. She's an old mule on the subject of my schooling. She says, you stay home on weeknights, Billy Joe. And mostly that's what I do. But Arlie Wanderdale said, the management asked me to bring them talent, Billy Joe, and I thought of you. Even before Mad Dog Craddock, I wondered. You and Mad Dog, Arlie Wanderdale said. Darn that blue-eyed boy with his fine face and a smooth voice, twice as good as a plowboy has any right to be. I suspected Mad Dog had come first to Arlie Wanderdale's mind, but I didn't get too riled. Not so riled I couldn't say yes. Permission to play. Sometimes, when Ma's busy in the kitchen or scrubbing or doing wash, I can ask her something in such a way I annoy her just enough to get an answer, but not so much as I get a no. That's a way I found gaining what I want, by catching Ma off guard, especially when I'm after permission to play piano. Right out asking her is no good. She always gets testy about me playing, even though she's the one that truly taught me. Anyway, this time I caught her in the slow stirring of biscuits and her mind on other things. Maybe that baby growing inside her, I don't know. But anyhow, I was determined enough, and she was distracted enough. This time, I got just what I wanted. Permission to play at the palace. Now this page, I'm gonna show you real quick. It's called On Stage. What do you think that looks like? If I turn it sideways. That's one of the cool things about poetry is the way that you put it on the page helps add to the meaning. So when I look at this, I think it looks like you guess while I read, see if you can figure it out. When I point my fingers at the keys, the music springs straight out of me. Right hand playing notes sharp as tongues, telling stories while the smooth, buttery rhythms back me up on the left. Folks sway in the palace aisles, grinning and stomping and out of breath, and the rest eyes shining, fingers snapping, feet tapping. It's the best I've ever felt playing hot piano, sizzling with mad dogs, swinging with the black mesa boys on my own. Crazy. Pestering the keys, that is heaven. How supremely heaven playing the piano can be. Do you see it? They look like piano keys, I think, anyways. Birthday for FDR. I played so well on Wednesday night, Arlie put his arm around my shoulder and asked me to come and perform at the president's birthday ball. 
Ma can't say no to this one. It's for President Roosevelt. Not that Mr. Roosevelt will actually be there, but the money collected at the ball, along with the balls all over the country, will go, in the President's name, to the Warm Springs Foundation, where Mr. Roosevelt stayed once when he was sick. Some day, I plan to play for Mr. Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself. Maybe I'll go all the way to the White House in Washington, D.C. In the meantime, it's pretty nice Arlie asking me to play twice for Joyce City. Not too much to ask. We haven't had a good crop in three years, not since the bounty of 31, and we're all whittled down to bone these days, even Ma with her new round belly, but still, when the committee came asking, Ma donated three jars of applesauce and some cured pork and a feed sack nighty she'd sewn for our coming baby. Mr. Hardley's Money Handling. It was Daddy's birthday and Ma decided to bake him a cake. There wasn't money enough for anything like a real present, so Ma sent me to fetch the extras with 50 cents she'd been hiding away. Don't go to Joy City, Billy, she said. You can get what we need down at Hardly's store. I slipped the coins into my sweater pocket, the pocket without the hole, thinking about how many sheets of new music 50 cents would buy. Mr. Hardly glared when the Wonder Bread door banged shut behind me. He squinted as I creaked across the wooden floor. Mr. Hardley was in the habit of charging too much for his stale food, and he made bad change when he thought he could get away with it. I squinted back at him as I gave him Ma's order. Mr. Hardley's been worse than normal since his attic filled with dust and collapsed under the weight. He hired folks for the repairs and argued over every nail and every last minute. The whole place took shoveling for days before he could open again, and some of the stock was so bad it had to be thrown away. The stove clanked in the corner as Mr. Hardley filled Ma's order. I could smell apples and ground coffee and peppermint. I sorted through the patterns on the feed bags, sneezed dust, blew my nose. When Mr. Hardly finished sacking my things, I paid the bill and tucking the list in my pocket along with the change hurried home so Ma could bake the cake before Daddy came in. But after Ma emptied the sack, setting each packet out on the oilcloth, she counted her change and I remembered with a sinking feeling that I hadn't kept an eye on Mr. Hardly's money handling. And Mr. Hardly had cheated again. Only this time he'd cheated himself, giving us four cents extra. So while Ma mixed a cake, I walked back to Mr. Hardley's store, back through the dust, back through the Wonder Bread door, and thinking about the second-hand music in a moldy box at the shop in Joy City, music I could have for two cents a sheet, I placed Mr. Hardley's overpayment on the counter and turned back to head home. Mr. Hardley cleared his throat and wondered for a moment, I wondered for a moment if he'd call me back to offer me a piece of peppermint or pick me out an apple from the crate, but he didn't. And that's okay. Ma would have thrown a fit if I'd taken a gift from him. Fifty miles south of home. In Amarillo, wind blew plate glass windows in, tore electric sign downs, ripped wheat straight out of the ground. And that's the first sign of real trouble to come in this book. And it's also where we're going to stop for today. So, uh, but it doesn't mean you have to stop. You can continue reading Out of the Dust by Karen Hess. Uh, you can pick it up from your library or local indie bookstore. I'll also put a link for it in the description in case you want to read it. Um, please come back for more great uh, novels and verse throughout the entire month of April. Um, I'm so excited. I have three amazing author interviews for you to follow those up um and it's going to be a great time so happy reading happy national poetry month happy april and i'll see you here again next time bye <laughs>